Hi, my name is Pastor Ronald Kozar, and I'm the senior pastor at Alpha Lions Dead Ministries in Derry, Pennsylvania. I'm just an old football player that has been saved by grace. I played several years with the New England Patriots and with the Detroit Lions. I just want to take this opportunity to welcome you into one of our services. I'm, I'm in a little teaching move this evening. Thank you. Thank you. So, what we've been talking about, this is part three. Part three, we've been discussing the difference. Rose, you've missed some good things. You need to get on YouTube and look them up. Look them up. Get on YouTube. We're talking, this is part three, about the difference between a holy day and the holidays, of which people today, the majority of the world today, celebrates the holidays, and they just think the holy days are for the Jews. And when you first start talking to someone about the holy days, and you start talking about the feast days and how they all piece together, they think that's for the Jews. Thank you, Greg. We should have turned that off earlier. Al had it roasty, toasty in there. I felt like I was in Florida. <laughs> ha, Hermie, it was warm in here today, buddy. I know. <laughs> Glory to God. So listen, th th these are the comparisons that, that we're looking at and the comparisons that I want to look at. We have just been studying in Luke, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter. There are some keys there that reveal to us when Jesus was born. I believe that Jesus was born in October and could be during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, this, that time frame of the year is a very, very interesting time of the year because you have Feast of Trumpets right in there, you have the Day of Atonement right in there, you have Feast of Tabernacles in there, and all these feasts are kind of bouncing all around. They're called the Fall Feasts. And then you have the Spring Feasts, of which you would consider the feast that we really look at is Passover, would be in April or Abib. Then you have the feast of first fruits, which would be Jesus was the first fruit of many brethren when he raised from the dead. Fifty days after Passover would be the feast of Pentecost. Now those, please hear this, this is extremely important. Those are the spring feasts. So you have spring feasts, of which we look at Passover, Feast of First Fruits, and Pentecost, which happened 50 days after the crucifixion of our Lord. Then you have the fall feasts, which you would be considering feasts that we look at or consider that Feast of Trumpets, um, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Those are, those are the separate feasts like that. Now, when you look at the breakdown of them, what's interesting that, that I want people to start to see are the, the spring feasts pointed towards Jesus' first coming. Are you with me? The spring feasts are pointed towards Jesus' first coming to the earth. He came as a babe. They thought he was coming as a king. He's not coming as a king until his second coming. Now the fall feasts point towards the second coming. And this is what we're looking at. There are certain feasts that need to be fulfilled, but the, but the crux of what we've been teaching and what we've been looking at is that Feast of Tabernacles. Now there is a Feast of Trumpets and there's also the Day of Atonement. There's some things in there that happen right in that time frame. But when we're tying these in, I look at these feasts coming out of those three specific feasts that are mentioned in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. That's what got me to separate them a little bit because he said three times in the year, you're to appear before the Lord and you're not to come empty handed. So we know the one is Passover that falls right into the, to the um, um, 
uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then you have the Passover, which is 50 days after the Passover. Pentecost, which is 50 days after Passover. So we look at those two specifically. And then the other one that we're looking at is the one at the end of the year, which would be what I am looking at as the, the second coming of the Lord is the Feast of Tabernacles when he comes back to tabernacle with mankind again. Now, as far as the Feast of Trumpets, I can't say that because I've been asked this and I've been looking at this and, and I really don't know how it's going to break down. And we've talked about the half hour pause, that there's going to be a, a, a period of about a half hour where there's totally silence in heaven. And people were asking me, well, what could that be? Well, that half hour in heaven could be total silence because heaven is emptied out because they're coming down to the earth to battle at the battle of Armageddon. There may not be anybody in heaven. Or there may be totally silence in heaven before they come down to the battle of Armageddon just preparing for that. But it would be hard for me to believe that there would be total silence then. But that is a, a quick little overlay and a summary of how, how we're looking at some of these feasts and, and the things that we want to get into because we're, I want people, I want the modern day church to see the difference between what people consider holidays today because that's where a lot of the heathen celebrate. It's like we, we look at these and I, and I wrote down a couple of these. I said, okay, these are the comparisons. We can look at the, the birth of our Lord and Savior, and we can compare that to Christmas. It's one or the other. It, it can't be both, because they're not the same day. It's not the same man. It's not the same celebration. It's a heathen practice that has been bled into the church, or a heathen practice, in other words, that the church has accepted just because of the majority that's accepted it. We've never really, that part of the modern day church has still not come out of the dark ages. And what I mean by that is when the early apostles were killed and the early church was, was basically put to death, martyred and died for the, the name of Christ. Ever since then, there has been a period of restoration where God is revealing truth into the church and the church is coming out and coming out and come, a little bit by little. That's where Martin Luther came from. That, that's where the, the Methodists came from. That's where the Wesleys come from. That's where Isuzu Street came from and the Pentecostal revival came from. And all these things are just truths that the modern day church has gotten a hold of that's come through a man or a ministry and revival takes place and we've had landmarks to see where the church has grown, that we've come out of this dark age period. Now, a lot of the people think the church has arrived, that we're there. But when you really start looking at this, I've been saved, you know, 40, 41 years now, and I had to relearn a lot of stuff. You have to be willing, when you really see the truth of the feast and the feast that God said are his feasts. He said there are eternal feasts. They're not Jewish feasts, they're not Gentile feasts, they're, in, they're eternal feasts, and they're God's feasts. So, you need to look at Jesus' birthday compared to this thing that people celebrate as Christmas. Then the other one that you need to look at that is very important is the Passover. Because that's one of the Lord's feasts. I mean, that's the Passover when the Lord was crucified. But then the world celebrates Esther or Easter. And that's when the Lord resurrected. And it, it ain't even the same thing. It's not celebrated on the same day. It's not even the same principle. Because the Passover, the feast of the Passover, you are looking, Jesus said, when he talked in the Last Supper, when he talked in the Passover meal, it wasn't. It wasn't communion as most people celebrate communion today, and it is not Easter as people celebrate Esther today. It was the Passover. It wasn't about celebrating the resurrection. It was about looking when we partake of communion. Jesus said he took the bread, blessed it, gave it. Then in the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the New Testament. 
He said, for as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim my death until I return. It was not about the resurrection. When we partake of communion and we look at that and we celebrate, that's why when you really compare them and you look at these points, it, Easter has nothing to do with the Passover. It really doesn't. There's nothing there. They, Easter and the way the pagans celebrate, people that don't even know Jesus are celebrating it. Do you know, do you know that atheists and heathens and, and, and people that are monks and, and Mormons and everything, do you know they celebrate Christmas? They celebrate, some of them celebrate Easter. Because it's not the true feast. It's not really what it was all about. It's just a pagan type of worship. Hey, they believe in old Saint Nick. They believe in the Easter Bunny. They believe in painting eggs and putting up that idol and all that. They, they participate in that. But hey, if you start talking about Jesus and you start talking about the Passover specifically, and you start talking about Pentecost specifically, and you start talking about the birth of Jesus Christ specifically, and not about Saint Nick. I blew three mics out Sunday singing Satan Cause was coming to town. <laughs> you know that's bad. When you sing and you blow three mics out, that's bad. But we need, we need to look at who's coming to town. We're looking at Jesus coming back to this earth. So, we're talking about Jesus' birth or Christmas. We're talking about Passover or Easter. And we're also looking at this thing where people are talking about New Year's Eve. What is that all about? Well, I went back and started studying that. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a holiday that's about 4,000 years old. They were celebrating this pagan means of worship. They had this god, it, it was called Janus, J-A-N-U-S, and it, it was a two-faced beast. And the, and the head of this monster looked backwards, and it represented people looking at the past year. And then the other face of the monster looked forward into the next year, the coming year, and they used to make sacrifices unto this idol, this Janus God, and they would make pledges to it. And the pledges would be like, I'm going to lose weight in the next year. I'm going to do this. I'm going to sacrifice my children to this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pledge finances to this. I'm going to make this change in the upcoming year. That's where New Year's Eve came from. So then, if, if you just want to con continue on to this thought with me, as I'm just showing a, an outline of where we're going to dig into and get into more is, is I really want you to be mindful in the whole concept of this thing, of there really being a devil, which there is, and there is really being a God who has established these holy days. Now, if the devil really wanted to just contaminate specific months. I mean whole months, not just a holy day, but a whole month. You look at what happens right after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, man, people put out their Christmas lights, they put up their Christmas trees, they adorn their trees, everybody's buying gifts for everybody except Jesus. And then all of a sudden, from Thanksgiving all the way through December, people were looking at this thing for Christmas. But if you want to talk about the birth of Jesus, if you ask most people when that happened, they don't even know when it happened. But let's just say, according to my belief and according to what I think, I think it happened in October. Well, October is one of the most holy months of the year. That's where the Feast of Trumpets happen right in that period. The Day of Atonement happens right in that period. And specifically, and most importantly, in my opinion, the Eternal Feast, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, happens on October 15th. The 15th day of the seventh month, in other words. Sometimes that varies on our heathen calendar, but I should get my terminology right. But it's the 15th day of the seventh month. 
and and um, the feast of Passover happens on the 14th day of the first month, which would be Abib. So when you're looking at this and you look at okay, Octo let's think about October. October. Well, if 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 somebody was the devil, of which there is a devil, and he wanted to get everybody's eyes off of Jesus. And he wanted to get everybody's eyes off of the birth of the Christ and really celebrating his birthday. The first thing he would do is get it off that month. So he got everybody looking at December. And then, and then he, he, he gets a saint, he gets, puts an individual, puts him in a sainthood, and gets people worshiping him during that month. Gets all their eyes off of Jesus. And then, to, to, to put the icing on the cake, they, they worship this Satan cause, and they put this Christmas deal, and they do all this on December, which is not even Jesus' birthday. But on top of that, he is just so evil and so manipulative, and so there's a wisdom to what he does, a, a method to his madness. So then when you look at October, you think, well, what happens in October? It's Halloween. So that whole month, if you watch people in October, they go absolutely crazy in October. They're celebrating demon spirits and they got cemeteries in their front yard and they got people hanging from the front porch and they got evil spirits all over the place. And you're thinking, what are these people thinking? I'll guarantee you they're not worshiping and celebrating Jesus' birthday through the month of October. Just think about this. If Jesus' birthday was in October, of which I believe according to Luke 1, we can prove that it was in October. There's probably hardly anybody out of Gentiles that really honor and, and look forward and worship on that month to point towards the birth of Jesus Christ. Because everybody sucked into Christmas. So if we really don't come out from among them being, and be separate, we're just like them. So we're celebrating Christmas just like they do. We celebrate New Year's Eve just like they do. We celebrate Easter or S. As previously mentioned, we are an outreach ministry. So even if you need to ride to church, just give us a call. Please dial 724-393-4799. And hey, we'll even come and pick you up. Like they do. It ain't even on the right days. It ain't even on the right months. And when you look at the months that there are, I mean, then you go to, to Abib or April, and what does the devil do on that month? Well, the first day of that month is what? April Falls. Why? Because everybody who, wor who, who worships on that month, they're, they're worshiping. And they're looking forward to this rabbit and this chicken eggs and this worshiping Esther and this foreign goddess and all these things. And they're not even looking at the Passover. And, and, and Satan has that audacity to be able to paint that whole month and get everybody to say, to call everybody an April Fool. Oh, April Fools. Oh, you're an April Fool. Oh, April Fools. April Fools. And it, it just makes a mockery out of the whole month. So, we're looking at Jesus' birthday, the true birth of Christ. I'm, I'm going to hit this very lightly this evening. I'm going to go through this. Just because Rose hasn't heard it, she needs to hear it. In Luke 1... Verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zechariah of the division of Abaha, and his wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord found blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well in advanced in years. So that is there for a reason. That is a landmark in the word of God for a reason. So when you study that priesthood and you understand when they met, that priesthood, the certain priest Zechariah of the division of Abahon, they met the second half of the fourth month. 
the second half of the fourth month. So you would go April, May, June, July. So they would be meeting there in the middle of July. So that gives you a landmark. You could start off in mid-July. Then you go over here to Luke 21, I mean Luke 1, 24, it says, now after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and she hid herself for five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. So listen, they give us a six month landmark. And they're letting you know that in that six month, Mary would have conceived. So by the time it comes over here and it says in Luke 136, now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Now you go over to verse 56. Luke 1, 56. Luke 1, 56 says this, And Mary then remained with her about three months and returned back to her house. Now Elizabeth's full term or full time came for her to be delivered, and she then brought forth a son. So Elizabeth's full term ran. That was a nine-month pregnancy. Then it comes over to here and it says, talking about Mary and Joseph, that in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into a city, um, into Judah, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Verse 5, to be registered to marry his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. This was Mary also stating that Mary also ran full term. So if you look at this and you say that Mary conceived during Elizabeth's sixth month, there would be six months there. Okay, from when the priesthood met, you would start at that fourth and a half month, and then you would go six months from there, plus Mary's full term, her nine-month term. That would be 15 months. Are you with me? 15 months would be six months and nine months. You add those together. The six months from when the priesthood met which would be halfway through the fourth month, month, which we decided would be like midway through July. Then you need six months from there, and then you need nine months from there for Mary to run a full term. That would be 15 months. So if you're looking at July, you'd be July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. June, July, August, September, October. 15 months exactly puts you right in the middle of October. Now what happens in the middle of October? October 15th is the Feast of Tabernacles. And I really believe, I believe that the, the spring feasts point towards the first coming of Jesus. The fall feast point to the second coming of Jesus and I believe by looking at this scripture and seeing the revelation of this scripture I believe that Jesus came during that month during that period of the feast of tabernacles which would have been exactly halfway through that month of October on our calendar October it would be about October 15th 
And, and even if it wasn't on that exact day, that, that feast of the Feast of Tabernacles, of which we're learning, is a seven-day feast. So Jesus could have been born any one of those days from, from October 15th, let's say if it was the 15th day of the seventh month, to the 21st of October. And he would have came the first time during the Feast of Tabernacles, and I believe he's coming the second time during the Feast of Tabernacles. I always thought he was coming to fulfill the fall feast would be the second coming, and I thought he would be coming during the Feast of Tabernacles, and that also fulfills where people say no one knows the day or the hour. Well, if he comes during a seven-day feast, no one knows the day or the hour. He's going to come somewhere during that seven-day feast. But I never saw until recently just studying and studying and, and asking God to give me what I asked God is I wanted scriptural proof. I wanted something scriptural where I could point towards the birth of Jesus, some type of mystery, something that was in the word that was more than just, well, you know, I think this, or well, I think that, or I think this, or I think that, or everybody thinks something. That's why I really never had a piece about picking a time or knowing a term in I just, I'm just really excited about how all these things are piecing together. I believe it is absolutely phenomenal. Now, so we looked at Luke 1, and I believe that gives us that time frame on when Jesus was, came the first time to the earth. This is his first birth about halfway through October there, and I believe he's coming the second time also. Now let's go back to Let's go back to, like, Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy. I want to look at some things. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. I'm going to show you some, ex some very interesting things. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy. Now... Look, like I say, I say a, a mystery is a hidden truth that can only be seen by a divine revelation. So once you see the revelation behind something, when you start to read with that in, uh, with that in your mind, you begin to see other things. In Ephesians 3.3, 3, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and he said this, Ephesians 3.3, 3, he said, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So by referring to this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. You'd have to know what the this is. If you don't know what well, he said, by referring to this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. You've got to know what the this is. If not, you don't get to understand the revelation of the mystery of Christ, because Christ is a mystery. The, the book of Revelation is really the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And for people not to know eschatology, which is the, the study of the last days, the end times, the things that point to the second coming of Christ, you really don't know how all this fits together. And I'm telling you, if you don't understand the feasts, if you've never caught the revelation of the feasts, you will never understand the revelation of the mystery that lies behind the return of the second coming of Christ. It is impossible. It is impossible for that to happen. There is no way that you could understand if you don't understand the feast days and if you don't understand the mystery behind them. If you just think they're the Jewish people, you'll never ever understand the mystery that lies behind the second coming of Christ. Because that's what points towards his coming. He has to fulfill the feast. Jesus was Jewish. Now, watch this. I've read this a thousand times. I've, I've read this Deuteronomy 16 a thousand times. And the revelation that I got this evening that hit me, I'd never seen it in this way. He said this. The first five words, it says, observe the month of Abib. 
When I, when I was studying this, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought, observe the month of Abib. Well, wait a second. First of all, nobody today really understands that that's the first month of the year. And they're taking the first month of the year and they're celebrating Janus, even though they, they'll say they're not. That's exactly what they're doing. It has just been accepted in the church. Hey, I got to say this and then I'll get back to this first. I was watching a television show today, of which I don't watch too many because I'm usually not at home and I'm pretty busy. But I watched a Jewish program today. And, and I love my Messianic Jewish people. I think they walk in great revelation and, and this and that and all that is peachy. But I'm telling you what, I watched this one today and the whole program was about juicing. And I thought, I told Deborah, I said, I'm just going to call this show the, Jew, the Jewish juicer. She said, you're crazy. I said, what's the Jewish juicer day? What's all we're talking about is juicing. And then the reason why they decided to talk about juicing is because it's healthy. And they were talking about New Year's Eve celebrating and supporting New Year's Eve, making resolutions like losing weight, losing so many pounds in the first month, do it, making these offerings under this, whatever they're doing, whatever these resolutions are. And they're wrapping everything all around this New Year's Eve day. And I'm sitting there thinking, Deborah goes, you really need to call them or write them or email them or do something. And I'm thinking, these are even the people, the Messianic Jews and the people that are even have accepted Jesus Christ are celebrating the pagan holidays and really not looking at the holy days. I thought, how could they have so much knowledge in a sense and be supporting that day when it's not the first day of the year? And when you really look at that celebration and what that's all about, the church should have absolutely nothing to do with that. In Exodus 23, about verse 16 there, it says, listen, that we're not supposed to imitate their worship of pagan gods or idols. We're not supposed to imitate them. We're not supposed to look like them. We're not supposed to do nothing like they do. As a matter of fact, we're supposed to expose them and tear them down. So Deuteronomy 16.1 says, we're to observe the month of Abed. Observe the month of Abed. I thought, well, okay. Let me look at the month of Abed and what we do in the month of Abed as a country. As a country, the first day of the month, what we celebrate is April Fool's. Because we don't honor the new year like we should honor the new year and how we should honor the new year. So that's what happens in our beginning of the new year. And then right after that, we start worshiping the rabbit. The whole month of Abib, that's what people do. They worship the rabbit. They got the chicken basket ready. They got all the eggs in the basket. They do their Easter egg hunts. They offer the eggs up. Everybody's, I mean, that's what happens in April. They're really not talking about the Passover. They really don't honor or celebrate the Passover. I just love when Betty does the Passover meal because I think it just shows everybody just a little bit about that and it gets our focus off the Easter Bunny. And it's not even the same day anyway. <laughs> so when, when you look at these comparisons and man, I wish I need to find somebody that's good on these charts and diagrams. I see. Some of these people on the internet, man, they're doing these fancy charts and diagrams and all this stuff. I, I get these revelations. I just can't put them on a chart. It's just not my calling, I guess. Maybe someday I'll have fancy charts too, but I don't know. 
So I, I keep looking at this and I keep examining this and every time I want to, I, I look at this and I say, okay, Lord, you want us to observe it. Okay, so I'm looking at it and I'm observing it. And Another large part of our ministry is our food outreach. This is called His Food Ministry. If you want to know more about this aspect of our ministry, please go to www.hisfoodministry.net. I'm looking at stuff in my office and I'm going, man, when I compare Jesus' birthday to Christmas, there, there are like five things here about Jesus' birthday and five things there over Christmas or ten things about Christmas, and not one of them is the same. When you really look at the holy day of which if God, if we were standing before God, or like I say, when Jesus comes back for the millennium, you are not going to be celebrating New Year's Eve. You're not going to be celebrating Easter, and you're not going to be celebrating Christmas. I will absolutely guarantee it. When Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom on this earth, we are not going to be celebrating the holidays. We will be celebrating the holy days because then Jesus is king. And right now, the way we're celebrating them, he is not king because we're worshiping the pagan idols and pagan goddesses. That's the difference. Okay, here's one for you. Look at this one. I thought this was interesting because I'm still observing. I'm observing the holy days, comparing them to the holidays. It says, it's all of a sudden over here, it says, Here's one for you for Christmas because we're talking about idolatry and God giving these feasts and telling the people what to do and what not to do. One of the things that he tells them not to do is this. He said, you shall not plant for yourself any tree. As a wooden image near the altar which you build for yourself to the Lord your God, you shall not set up any sacred pillars which the Lord your God hates. So what do we do? We celebrate the Lord's birthday, not even on the day it's his birthday, and everybody grows these Christmas trees and they put them up in their houses. Which is just a, it's just another thought that I think we maybe should consider. So when I was looking at these, I see these in Deuteronomy. If we go to Leviticus, Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23, it lays these out very nicely. We're talking about the difference between the holy days and the holidays. He says in Leviticus 23, he said, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them something, say something, say this to them, that these are the feast of the Lord. These are not a Jewish feast. These are not for Jewish people. These are the Lord's feast, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. So then verse 4 says, These are are the feasts of the Lord. They are holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Is that what it says in your Bible? There are Moedims, there are appointed times. So listen, if the appointed time for the birth of Christ would be in October and we're celebrating it in December, do you think we're missing it a little bit? If you think the appointed time to celebrate the Passover, the specific time of the Passover and the crucifixion of our Lord, and you think that celebrating Esther is the exact same as that, you are sadly mistaken. And if you're celebrating New Year's Eve and celebrating that as the beginning of the new year in the way 
that the pagans and the heathen celebrate that rather than honoring Abib and considering that month and observing Abib like God commanded us to do, you are absolutely missing the whole program. You're not even close. If this is, is exactly what God says, that these certain feasts are his feasts and they are appointed times, what that word means is Mohedim. They are specific times that God has set on his calendar. One of the greatest schemes of the devil, I believe, is to redo the calendar like he's done it. I believe to put us in a Gregorian calendar and get us away from the Jewish calendar was the greatest attempt of the enemy to keep the church from the truth. And now we're in deep. Because the whole world system revolves on the calendar. And you get off that calendar, they think you're nuts. We need to start celebrating the beginning of the new year when the new year begins. And we need to be celebrating the Passover on the day of the Passover. And we need to be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles during the month of Feast of Tra Tabernacles and at least giving honor to that. I don't want to go back and convert to Judaism because some people get crazy on that. And they just go right back and they want to be a Jew again. And I, I don't believe in that either. I believe in what the scripture says to honor these certain feasts. And everything evolves around these specific feasts. So... He tells you specifically, these are the feasts of the Lord. They're holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. They have an appointed time of the year. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight, this is the Lord's Passover. This is the most, one of the most important times in the history of the world. And we cannot honor this day. Why? Because I believe the devil has been on a scheme to change everything. And we need to expose it. We need to overturn it. Might make some people mad, but hey, we all get together on the holidays and fight anyway. <laughs> Do it for Jesus. Stir a little ruckus up for Jesus. No, they'll drag you right into their pagan feast. And on the 15th day of the same month, which is the day right after the Passover, this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread, and on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So that's when you celebrate the Passover. Then you come over here, and the next one he says... Well, in Leviticus 23, 16, you're to count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering. That would be actually the, the uh, Feast of Pentecost. But what I want you to look at is in verse 34, Leviticus 23, verse 34, Leviticus 23, 34. Remember, we're to observe these days, they're holy convocations. Which ones? These specific feasts. Not every single feast, but these specific feasts. He said, Speak to the children of Israel, saying the 15th day of the seventh month. Well, when's the 15th day of the seventh month? With well, Babib's the first month, you'd have April, May, June, July, August, September, October. So if we're to observe that month, as it says in, in um, Deuteronomy 16, 16, 1. Deuteronomy 16, 1 said, look, we're to observe this. Observe this month. Observe these months. Look at them. See what's happening. So if we're to observe that month, and we look at these holy, these mohadims, these divinely appointed days and times and dates and seasons by God, we've polluted that month by the most paganistic, heathenistic month that has ever been worshipped. We put Halloween and we celebrate the, the, the worship of evil spirits and demons and doctrines of demons and cemeteries and dead bodies hanging on our houses. And we don't think that brings a curse on our families. We don't think that this brings any kind of curse on our families. 
It's all scriptural. It goes back and tells us in Exodus 23. That's why the people are sick and afflicted of you. And then they go, oh no, we're, we're in the New Testament now. We're in the New Testament now, so we're all under grace. Right? That's what they say. So, watch. I'll just show you this. I'm just going to bounce all the way over here. Let me show you something. Bob, you with me? Yeah. All right. First Corinthians. I think it's 12 because I always just quote it. Because I had to memorize it because the Lord told me to memorize it. But we'll look at the Passover. I'm, I'm going to come back to this right here. But, but I'm telling you about why people, when he says in Exodus 23, he said, if you honor these feasts, what feasts? The three specific feasts. They're right there. And to be honest with you, the, the, some of them say the Passover and some say the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But then if it is, then you have these three times of the year you can come before the Lord. Passover or the, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which are, it's a seven-day feast. So you can come to the Lord before that time and bring a special offering. Then you have the Feast of Pentecost, which you know is 50 days after the resurrection. Then you have, at the end, the fall, you have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is another seven-day feast. So that's pretty interesting to me. But he said, if you honor these, you get these blessings. Or well, what are these blessings? Well, there won't, you're going to be, he's going to dispatch an angel on your behalf. He's going to fight your battles for you. He's going to do these things for you. He's going to, there will be nobody barren in your house. Well, then you may think, well, Mary was barren. So she always kept the Passover. Well, Elizabeth was barren. She was chosen to give birth to John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. Listen, please hear this. You've got to know how to rightly divide the word of truth. First mm -hmm. Peter 2.20 says that there are people who suffer for doing evil. And then there are people who suffer for doing what's right. There are two distinct groups of people. The people who suffer for the kingdom of God, for doing what is right, they find favor with God. Now listen, my wife just had to go through a brutal surgery. A brutal surgery. And, and when some of you see the picture of this fibroid, you are gonna, you're not going to believe it. And for God to do what he did, but I'm telling you this, and I told Betty this, her mother this, my mother-in-law, I said, I'm telling you this. We had to suffer, not in spite of our faith, or not because of sin, or not because of anything. We had to suffer because of our faith. And people might not be able to understand that, but when the battle started, like three years ago, the, when we prayed and fasted, we believed that she was not going to have to have a surgery. That was, the, that was the prayer. That was the belief. That's what we all fasted for. That's what we all prayed for. So, every single time, the fibroid would shrink, because it shrunk, I mean, from massive sizes, it would shrink to small, very small sizes. We had the opportunity, we had the ability to go in right then and have that thing removed, it would have been in and out, no big deal, no surgery, in and out within an hour, done. Send her home, she'll be good to go. Laparoscopic, no, no big deal. But the decision was made not to be cut, to go through with it to the end and believe that, that God was gonna heal her until the very last moment. So when that happened the first time, we passed that. Went for the second time, passed that. Went for the third time, passed that. And we kept passing over that. Why did we do that? Then we suffered, not in spite of or not because of anything, but it was because of our faith. It was the choice that we had to go through what we had to go through. And, and it was, a, it was a, a conscious decision that she made to go the whole, the whole mile to really trust and believe God right to the end. And then we shifted gears and said, okay, if you have to go through it, give us the grace to go through it. Fast operation, quick recovery, no pain pills, no, no products, none of this stuff, and boom, God deliver. So that, that's, that's the flip side of the coin. So only you know why at times you have to suffer. 
Because sometimes you suffer for doing bad. There are people that are hurting, that are in pain, that have suffered, that have things for whatever reason. That's between them and God. But when you get over when you get over here to the Lord's Supper and celebrating the Passover and looking at this, how God really lays this out, when they were celebrating the Passover, of which we're discussing as being one of God's three feasts that we really honor, he says this. He said in 1 Corinthians 11 20, he said, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. Well, I wonder what else they're doing. I know for probably 35 years of my Christian life, when I come to partake of communion and looking at the Last Supper and all the things that I was ever taught, I never, ever was looking at that with the Passover even in my mind at all. Until I really saw the revelation that lied behind it, I really never was thinking, when I come to take communion, I was never looking at the whole revelation behind the Passover. I wasn't coming with, with that in my mind. Because I'd never been taught it. So then he says, for an eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and the other is drunk. What? He said, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and have and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? No, I, I'm not going to praise you. For I, I received from the Lord that which also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. What, what night was he betrayed? It, it was when he told them to prepare the Passover meal. That's what this is. This isn't, well, I mean, technically, yes, it's a Last Supper that they had. But it's another way that people have just contaminated it, and they don't call it the Passover meal. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, Easter has not, Easter, the people aren't celebrating. Even Christians, when they get a little glimpse of Easter and they don't like Easter, what they say is happy resurrection. They say happy resurrection day. Well, according to this, the Passover is honoring the death because the death is what was important. You can't have the resurrection unless you grasp the Passover and the death. So he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim what? The Lord's resurrection? No. He said, you proclaim the Lord's death. Till when? Until he returns. That's how long you do it until he returns. So we are to be doing this until he returns. Now this will mess up some of my preacher and people and rapture and, and rapture people. If you're to do this until he returns, you need to do it until he returns. And the time that he returns to the earth is at the end of the tribulation. He returns to the earth at the end of the tribulation. That's when he comes back to fight the battle of Armageddon and set up his kingdom on the earth. That's when he returns. So you're to do this until he returns. Therefore, here's what we're getting to. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for whoever eats and drinks. In an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak among you, many are sick, and many are dead. They're sleeping. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged anymore. But when we're judged, we're chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. That chastening of the Lord, when we're when we're judged, we're chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. I really believe that there is a chastening of the Lord where you've got to go through certain things so you will not be punished for eternity. There'll be things that you have to suffer on this earth and things you have to go through on this earth so you won't have to pay for it for eternity. That's what the chastening of the Lord is that he talks about in Hebrews 11 and 12. 
He said, don't faint when you're, when you're chastened by me. Don't, cha don't faint when you're corrected by me. There are certain things that you just have to go through. And I'm telling you, that's why there's many sick among us and afflicted. That's why many people have died early. Because they don't know how to rightly divide the word. They don't know how to rightly look at the feast. They don't know how to rightly look concerning the Lord's body in the Passover. These are his feasts. They're eternal feasts. I've showed in, in previous studies about how the Feast of Tabernacles is what started Daniel 70 weeks. And then you go to the end of Daniel weeks and then after when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom on the earth. In, in, um, I think it's in, in uh, Zechariah where it says that they're still celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. That's clean over in, I mean, after Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. There is so much we need to learn. So much that we need to learn. I just think, how, how? It's in Zechariah 14, 6. Zechariah 14, 6. That's after everything. It says that the, that the nations, the nations, God is going to command them to come back together and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. That's after everything. These feasts are eternal feasts. I believe it's time that we need to get this out, get the word out, and get it into the church. Amen? Amen. This is part three, I'm pretty sure. Part four will be Sunday. We're going to do a continuation on this, exactly what we looked at this evening. We're going to get a little bit more deeper into it, and you need to hear it over and over and over again. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, in the blessed name of your son Jesus, we bow before you and thank you for this word, Lord. We know that you are the word. And we ask that you would write this word on our heart that we would not sin against thee. I thank you for every man, woman, and child that has heard this word. I ask that it would be strength unto our bones, Lord God, that you would heal us, that you would strengthen us. And that we would mount up with wings as eagles. That we would run and not grow weary. That we would walk and faint not. I pray hedge protection around us. And strength and blessings. And prosperity and provision over us Lord. Until we meet again in Jesus name. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed our service. We want to welcome you. You can visit our church at any time. We are located at 716 West 4th Avenue in Derry, Pennsylvania. Our church services are Sunday morning from 9.30 a.m. to about 11.15. We also offer a free lunch after our service. Our Wednesday night services are 6.30 p.m. till 8 p.m. We want to welcome you to be a part of our family. We also want to give you the opportunity to purchase the book, that I have had the pleasure of writing. It's called Unveiling the New Covenant. It is based on the four decrees. You could simply do this by going online.